Good everybody. I'm Mary Ide from the Friends of the Library, and welcome to this evening's first Wednesday, brought to you by the Vermont Council on the Humanities. Now, we also have another Humanities Council series running, um, it's been the last few months, um, called uh, Mexican Americans and the Immigrant Experience. And the book this month, which will be on March 16th, at seven o'clock, I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> yeah, March 16th at seven o'clock, The Tortilla Curtain by T.C. Boyle, a book about middle class values, illegal immigration, xenophobia, phobia, poverty, and environmental destruction. So that's in two weeks upstairs in the meeting room. And books are always available for checkout at the main desk. Now, I, on Friday, Star Latronica, who you know would always be here in my place, but she has to teach out at Bing Bingington in, on um, Wednesday night, so that's why she's not here. But we will be meeting with the Vermont Council on the Humanities on Friday because they're looking for what we would like to have next year for the first Wednesday series. So if you have some thoughts along those lines, I hope this evening you'll fill out an evaluation and share your thoughts with us and we can see what kind of program we might get that would be something along the lines you're interested in. One last note, we just put up an exhibit, the altered book. Maybe many of you are familiar with an altered book is a book that is refashioned in artistic, and abstract and other ways by an artist. And the artist's book here is by Suzanne Rosano, who you may know. And um, take a look at the little essay that was written by one of our board members, Amir Flesher, that talks about the kind of the history of the altered book. Okay, tonight, I think some of you may remember Nancy J. Crumbine was here about two years ago and spoke about Rumi. Well, she's back with us tonight. Hey, Rumi. <laughs> she's a poet and associate professor of writing and rhetoric at Dartmouth College. She is also a minister with the Universal Unitarian Church. She holds a PhD in philosophy and two master's degrees in philosophy and religion. She has lectured widely under the auspices of the New Hampshire and Vermont Humanities Councils, the National Council on Aging, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Religion and Education Conferences, both in the US and in the UK. In addition to her uh, academic articles, she is the author of, and I love this title, Humility, Anger, and Grace. Meditations Towards a Life That Matters. And as a matter of fact, she has that book with her tonight, many copies, which you are welcome to purchase at the end of this evening's <coughs> presentation. So please welcome Nancy J. Crumbine. Thank you, everybody. So we've before I, oh, I have to turn myself on here. <laughs> uh, how's that? Are we on? Woo! Okay. He's going to adjust, this wonderful man's going to adjust the volume. I warned him I had a loud voice. How many were here two years ago with Rumi? Yeah, that was a fun night, wasn't it? I remember that very well. Um, this podium is so high, and this is the only library in Vermont that has a balcony. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah. Okay, I'm going to um, try to record this. We're going to have a wonderful evening with E.B. White. Um, wow, okay, so let's see how I do this. Maybe I'm not going to do this. Sorry. But this is going to be... Okay, I guess I won't do that. Um, so, um, yes. And some technology person will be able to figure out how to get the sound off of it. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank Mary and this wonderful library. I'm just delighted to be back here. 
And I uh, especially want to ask, uh, thank Allie White, who runs this First Wednesdays uh, series. Uh, she's been wonderful to me. I've been doing three a year now for, the, for as long as I can remember. Um, oh, and in your evaluation, put down that you want to hear Rachel Carson. <laughs> it's my next talk I'm giving in Middlebury. I'm very excited about it. Uh, but tonight, Allie White uh, is responsible for E.B. White because she, uh, we were talking about a few years ago what I would do next season and she said how about E.B. White and I didn't know anything about E.B. White beyond Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little my favorite book ever <laughs> and uh, I said well I don't know anything. anyway oh and elements of style of course which I've used in teaching and um, so she gave me E.B. White I mean she just said well go read his essays and tell me what you think and I just was like I can't believe I have the privilege of sharing him with you because uh, what a gift. How many of you are familiar with his essays? Good, okay. And the library, I take it, has all his essays? Yes, I'm sure. Um, so when I first gave this talk in, in Newport, Vermont, the, the librarian, bless her heart, a wonderful woman, uh, introduced me and then said, and, he, and Nancy now will just uh, begin her talk on Charlotte's Web. And I said, I'm not speaking on Charlotte's Web. And she said, well, a little bit about Charlotte's Web. I said, well, no, not really. <laughs> and we had this sort of back and forth before she let me take the podium. And, um, yeah, so anyway, thank you, Allie White, for this great gift. I also have on display uh, the, my copies of E.B. White's, just so you can look at some photos there um, and just take a look at some of the the books that I will be reviewing, uh, and I'll put the books that I'm quoting from uh, on that table after my talk. So um, let's open with a, uh, let's just, oh, I want to say one other thing. This is more of a reading than, a, than an academic uh, discourse on uh, E.B. White, and it's because he's so accessible. You, you, you don't need a lot of analysis to understand E.B. White. That's one of the great things about him. He's the greatest essay writer that the United States has ever produced. Um, and I'm speaking into this, and I realize there's no microphone in it, so I'm, it's just a little ridiculous. <laughs> Go away. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it, it's, it was very different from Emily Dickinson. That's another talk you could put in your, your desire. Emily Dickinson and Annie Dillard, they're a wonderful combination. But you can't just read Emily Dickinson because nobody understands Emily Dickinson. So you, you have to do a lot of exposition. Um, E.B. White's quite different. So it will be, I will be essentially reading uh, after a chronology of his life, a review of his life. I'll be essentially just, ha we're having a reading, uh, a night with E.B. White, and I'll be making comments as as we go, of course. Um, so, um, <clears throat> let us begin. I have all of these numbered, and of course, the first one I can never find. Um, yeah, because I have them. Okay, this is a great start. <laughs> I have all this numbered. I reviewed these today, and now I have uh, can't find the first quote. So we'll just have to. It's a wonderful quote, though. Um, here it is. Okay. So let me t begin my talk because I have written the first sentence out, and the rest we're going to talk. On my, on my tenth birthday, Mary Martin moved in across the street from E. B. White in the Turtle Bay area of Manhattan. And somebody's nodding, they must know this quote. I know this because he begins his essay, Sootfall and Fallout, in Points of Compass, thus. October 18, 1956. This is a dark morning in the apartment, but the block is gay with yellow moving vans disg disgorging Mary Martin's belongings in front of a house a couple of doors east of here into which, I should say, from the looks of things, she is moving. <laughs> People's lives are so exposed at moments like this, their possessions lying naked in the street, the light of day searching out every bruise and mark of indoor living. It is an unfair expose, end tables with nothing to be 
at the end of, standing lamps with their cords tied up in curlers, bottles of vermouth craning their long necks from cartons of personal papers, and every wastebasket carrying its small cargo of miscellany. The vans cause a stir in the block, heads appear in the windows of number 230 across the way, passers-by passers stop on the sidewalk and stare brazenly into new home through the open door. I have a mezzanine seat for the performance. Like a peeping Tom, I lounge here in my bathrobe and look down, <laughs> held in the embrace of a common cold before which scientists stand in awe, although they have managed to split the atom, infect the topsoil with strontium-90, break the barrier of sound, and build the Lincoln Tunnel. <laughs> now, I, I can walk around because I don't, I'm not attached to that. May I walk around? Video okay. person, is that all right? That sounds good. Good. Um, um, so, did you see how, what, how he did this? Yeah. So he starts with, he's in his bathroom looking out the window, he sees Mary Martin, of all people, moving in across the street, mm -hmm. and he details, great details, that aren't really important to the world, and, but hilarious, Commenting on what it's like to move, there's some, some uh, just folk wisdom in there. And he ends up with the splitting of the atom and the topsoil infected with strontium-90. It's typical white. It's just a perfect opening uh, paragraph uh, to use. I'm glad I found it. Um, and of course, it's my birthday, so I had to share with it. <laughs> Let's go through their chron chronology briefly, if, if I could. Some of you may know this, but let, let me just, I'm just going to go briefly because there's so many wonderful things to read. He was born in uh, uh, <clears throat> 1899, Mount Vernon, New York, the youngest of six children, very shy, very. Um, Anxious, uh, and that ang and anxiety and depression uh, plagued him his whole life, and the shyness. It's said that in his New Yorker, his office at the New Yorker, if anyone came to to see him in the, and they were in the waiting room, he would crawl out the window. <laughs> um, went to Cornell. After he graduated from Cornell, he got a Model T and drove with his, some friends, drove across the country, 1922, in a Model T, driving across the country. Can you imagine? Yeah. Um, and got a job out west uh, with the Seattle Times, briefly, and then decided to jump on the SS Muford, headed to Alaska. And he... Um, about halfway up, he ran out of money. And so they were going to kick him off the ship. But he asked the captain if, he, if there wasn't anything that he could do to stay on the ship. And he, the captain found him a, a job as a fireman stoking the coal. Uh, but then they didn't know what to do with him because he was, he, they couldn't, they didn't, they didn't know whether to leave him in the room that they, they had him in or stick him down with the workers. Anyway, he stayed in the first class and, and worked his way up to Alaska. In 1925, he goes to New York and is hired by the famous, wonderful Catherine Engel at the time, the editor, the founding editor and really brilliant mind that is responsible for the beloved New Yorker magazine that we know and love today. She uh, is responsible for there being poetry in that magazine. She fought with uh, Harold... Uh, um, why do I blank on his name? Ross. Ross, thank you. Um, fought with him about that, and but he also knew that she was absolutely, they were just a perfect pair. In 1927, so, the, so 25, um, uh, E.B. White's hired by Catherine, and a few years later, uh, they married and lived happily ever after, quite literally. And E.B. White uh, wrote for him, for, for the New Yorker, for some total of some 60 years. His first book he wrote with James Thurber, and it's, I only mention it because the title is my favorite title of any book ever, Is Sex Necessary? 
I, of course, ran out and got that first after <laughs> Allie told me about this uh, talk. And uh, it's unfortunately a little dated, uh, but the title lives on. Uh, Joel, their son, was born uh, in 1930. Uh, Catherine had a son, some of you may well know, Roger Engel, who became a uh, fiction editor of The New Yorker, worked there also for many, many decades, and also famous for his baseball essays. Recently wrote a beautiful essay on being old. He's in his 90s, and it was an exquisite essay. And it, it, Just Google it. Roger Engel, age 90 or something, and you'll, you'll be able to find it. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Or email me, and I'll send you the link. Um, in 1938, um, they moved to Maine. They had bought a, a fa farm. They called Saltwater Farm because it's on Allen Cove. Anyone been to Brooklyn, Maine? Yeah. Yes. OK. So. Uh, in fact, are there any relatives of white in the audience? <laughs> Honest to God, I used to give this talk last month in St. Johnsbury, and not only was there a woman who had worked on the archives in Cornell and knew him and, and Catherine, but there were relatives who had married their son, and the daughter had married the grandson, and, stuff, uh, and a whole bunch of people from Brooklyn. So anyway, I had the privilege of being in Brooklyn last summer uh, for a week. It's totally serendipitously, I was able to, I found a, a, a or cottage for rent for a week, and poked around. Anyway, the farmhouse is this beautiful, beautiful uh, New England farmhouse. It's in private hands, as was their wish that it not turn into Charlotte's Cafe. Um, so it's a beautifully preserved, and the people who have bought it just have just done a beautiful job. But you can see it on the road. There are no trespassing signs, and I, I behaved, but I did walked past it about 20 times and, <laughs> and uh, taking pictures and then uh, you can see the Allen's Cove right from the from the bay it's absolutely beautiful uh, and uh, E.B. White known as Andy uh, absolutely loved it and convinced poor Catherine to move there I, and I say that hesitantly uh, there's a lot has been written about what she gave up by doing that she, she had the best job in the world she loved it and she kept at it. I mean, she continued editing uh, from afar, but it was very different than being in the office, uh, centrally, so centrally located. But she did it, uh, and they, they, he had a farm. He was raising baby chicks, and his descriptions are absolutely marvelous about freezing in the barn, keeping these 200 little baby chicks that he'd gotten in the mail, uh, <laughs> say, um, and pigs and sheep and uh, ducks and, and geese and, of course, Dachshunds, which we'll get to a little later. Uh, he loved, absolutely loved that farm. And during the war, uh, Howard Ross encouraged them to, to um, come back to New York. They got him, gave them an apartment in New York so they, they were back and forth uh, more. And, um, but they were home as, after, after 38. They were based in Maine. Um, he wrote from 1938 to 42, wrote for Harper's. And that One Man's Meat, uh, that's his first collection of essays, the one best known, is uh, the collection of the essays he wrote for Harper's, uh, published in 42 and then republished in 44 with some more essays added to it. Charlotte's Web, oh, then Stuart Little was in 45. He was depressed, often, as many writers are, he was quite depressed after the publication of, of these books. He had a, a, a real breakdown after One Man's Meat was published in 1942. Uh, 48, he, in 46, White Flag was published. It was a series of essays uh, that he wrote during the war. There, it's an amazingly relevant book. I'll be quoting from it later. It was in 1948. He was given an honorary degree by Dartmouth. Just a little local da uh, detail here, and uh, all the graduating seniors were given a copy of White Flag. Uh, uh, White had told Dartmouth that they should have been giving out uh, Thoreau's Walden. <laughs> More on that later. He's written a wonderful essay, which was a little book called Here Is New York. Lest you think he was just uh, a farmer. He loved New York, and his description of New York in that essay is, is just beautiful. Charlotte's Web, then the second book, uh, a children's book, and then the third wonderful book that's not as well talked about, uh, as well read, The Trumpet of the Swan. How many of you have read that? 
beautiful, deep, gorgeous, deep, natural detail about uh, the life of swans. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, he died, uh, as, as Catherine died in 1977, and he died in 1985 at his beloved farm. So that's the chronology, quick, very quickly. And we'll go on to the readings. And I want to start with some uh, October 1938 from, from One Man's Meat. You all know what was going on in October 38. Yeah? Things were heating up. We have Crystal Knock just one month after this is written. And again, notice how he does this. Long before the coming of the cold, I was on the barn roof, laying clear cedar shingles five inches to the weather. My neighbor's roofs all showed signs of activity, so I built some staging and mounted my own beanstalk <laughs> to see what I could see. It seems a long while ago that I was up there, hanging on by the seat of my pants, those clear days at the edge of frost, with a view of pasture, woods, sea, hills, and my pumpkin patch stretched out below in serene abundance. I stayed on the barn, steadily laying shingles, all during the days when Mr. Chamberlain, El Doce, and the Fuhrer were arranging their horse trade. It seemed a queer place to be during a world crisis, an odd thing to be doing. There was no particular reason for making my roof tight, as the barn contained nothing but a croquet set, some swallow nests, and a stuffed <laughs> moose head. In my trance-like like condition, waiting for the negotiations to end, I added a cupola to the roof to hold a vein that would show which way the wind blew. In some respects, though, a barn is the best place anybody could pick for sitting out a dance with a prime minister and a demagogue. I need to say how relevant this paragraph is. <laughs> Super Wednesday. <laughs> there is a certain clarity on a high roof, a singleness of design in the orderly work of laying shingles, snapping the chalk line, laying the butts to the line, picking the proper width shingle to give an adequate lap. One's perspective at that altitude is unusually good. Who has the longer view of things anyway? A prime minister in a closet or a man on a barn roof. <laughs> I'm down now, the barn is tight, and the peace is preserved. It is the ugliest peace the earth has ever received for a Christmas present. It is, it is the England eating swastika for breakfast instead of kipper mm. is a sight I had as leaf not lived to see. And though I am no warrior, I would gladly fight for the things Nazism seeks to destroy. This is an, in an essay entitled Clear Days. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, in the audience tonight, the four members of my book group <laughs> who came to, drove down from Cornish and um, very happy that they're here. It's a little unnerving to have <laughs> friends in the audience, but I'm, I'm managing all right. Am I, am I managing all right? OK. Um, but uh, I wanted to, one of the two books, one of the books we read is by Lynn Olson, Citizens of London. Has anyone read this book? Fabulous book. You cannot put it down. It reads like a novel. And share her other book, Those Angry Days. Citizens of London, about the Americans in London trying, uh, to, before the Americans entered the war, trying to get Roosevelt, etc., to wake up that Britain was falling and needed the United States support. The, her, her other book, Those Angry Days, are about 
the isolationists and the fight here, the angry fight between the isolationists and people like E.B. White, who felt we needed to go uh, uh, to support England and to fight Nazism. Uh, those two books I just recommend to you so highly, and having read those really brought home to me as I was reading E.B. White, uh, the power of this. The other, uh, there's another essay in this book called, um, it's a, it's a E.B. White's answer to Anne Murrow Lindbergh, who wrote infamously the book, The Ways of the Future, in which she defended her husband's isolationism. If she defended it, I should say, with some great ambivalence. She did not agree with him, but as a good wife in the, in the times, in the 40s, um, she felt she had to defend him. Um, her story, as some of you may know, is quite astounding. In any case, the book was a terrible defense of uh, it was terrible, and, and he wrote a very uh, biting, polite and gentle but biting critique. I'm not going to quote that for him, but that's also in One Man's Meat, and I urge you to read it. Um, a little bit more on the war. This is from the essay Second World War, September 1939. War comes to each of us in his own fashion. Shall I remind you that, uh, that uh, the, the war began in September 1939? With Germany rolling into Poland. War comes to each of us in his own fashion. Early on that Sunday, when England and France finally lost their patience, wishing to put my affairs in order, I cleaned my comb and brush. <laughs> pouring a few drops of a household ammonia into the bowl of water, running the comb through the brush, then brushing the comb with a nail brush. <laughs> this juxtapos all the way through these essays, this juxtaposition of the mundane and the horrifyingly global. At breakfast, there was a house guest in a bathrobe. She approached the war intellectually through Versailles. After breakfast, I went to the garage and sorted some nails, putting the clabbered nails together in a bunch, the six-penny nails together, the boarding nails together in cans. Can you just imagine this? The, the horror of the war starting, and this is how he's coping with it, by sorting nails, right? We do this, don't we? The blade of my jackknife being stiff, I eased it with a few drops of penetrating oil. We decided we would go to church. They never went to church, by the way. They were not churchgoers. Uh, I, I went into the beautiful church that they did go to on, on, on this occasion um, uh, in the town. But uh, we decided we would go to church on this, obviously, on this day. A solemn place for a solemn hour. The preparation was hurried as though we were organizing a picnic on the spur of the moment. Church is at 10.30 here. The little boy was in tears about having to wear the blue suit, yet wanting to go. I wore a hat I found in a closet. The minister, a young fellow I recently sold some old hens to for a dollar apiece, said he believed the meek would inherit the earth. We sang, uh, am I a soldier of the cross? Are there no foes for me to fight? The shopkeeper passed the plate. When we got back home, I went out to the barn to fix some chum bait, and somebody came out after a while and announced, dinner and the king. <laughs> The words came with painful slowness as we all sat and chewed. Thus began the second war for democracy. That, of course, is the famous speech of which the movie, The King's Speech, over the radio, the wireless. Also incredibly timely is his concern for <clears throat> First Amendment rights. This is from a letter to the New York Herald Tribune, 1947. I am a member of a party of one, and I live in an age of fear. Nothing lately has unsettled my party and raised my fear so much as your editorial on Thanksgiving Day, suggesting that employees should be required to state their beliefs in order to hold their jobs. 
The idea is inconsistent with our constitutional theory and has been stubbornly opposed by watchful men since the early days of the Republic. I can only assume that your editorial writer, in a hurry to get home for Thanksgiving, <laughs> tripped over the First Amendment and thought it was the office cat. <laughs> I don't know if we have writers like this anymore. <laughs> this is in this book, The White Flag, that I mentioned earlier. And again, these, these, uh, this, this, all right, I'll just, January 26, 1946. At their earliest convenience, the delegates to the United Nations organization should form an orchestra. <laughs> There must be among those 700 men and women enough fiddlers, flautists, cellists, trombonists, and drummers to make up a sizable band. And if the delegates were to organize one and perform together, the effect on the world would be incalculable. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt could learn the triangle. <laughs> That's perhaps one of his funniest lines. <laughs> Elder Roosevelt can learn the triangle. Once a week, all deliberations, all matters of state should be put aside and the public invited to the assembly hall to hear that rarest of sounds, the concord of nations. <laughs> Next morning, the papers, instead of carrying the latest installment in the long, uneasy story of international dissension, could report that the second movement had never been more solidly handled by the strings and that Vashinsky turned in a masterful performance on the glockenspiel. <laughs> there is, in fact, great need that the UNO delegates find some human activity or pastime which will il illustrate people's ability to lose themselves in a universal theme to harmonize and to create beauty by following a single score rather than 51 separate scores. As you all know, E.B. White loved dogs. In particular, he loved his dachshunds, and in particular, he loved his dachshund Fred. A little background on this. <coughs> Dean Acheson was Secretary of uh, State under Truman from 49 to 53, and Louis Brandeis, most distinguished Supreme Court Justice, first Jewish Supreme Court Justice, uh, one of the greatest um, defenders of freedom of speech and right to privacy that we have ever had, appointed by Woodrow Wilson. And there was, um, yes, well, I don't know, very controversial, but he was finally approved. So this scene, this is a, this is a, a essay called Bedfellows from Points of My Compass. And the scene is that uh, E.B. White is in bed with his beloved dog, Fred. And um, Fred loves bird watching. Uh, and he's, it's this long description about how he settles into the bed and watches birds. But I'm going to pick it up uh, in the middle. So spotting a flicker or a startling on the wing, he would turn and make a quick report. I just saw an eagle go by, he would say. It was carrying a baby. This was not precisely a lie. Fred was like a child in many ways and sought always to blow things up to proportions that satisfied his imagination and his love of nature. He was a Cecil... Cecil B. DeMille of dogs. He was a zealot, and I have just been reminded of him by a quote from one of the Democrats sharing my bed, Atchison quoting Brandeis, quote, the greatest dangers to liberty, said Mr. Brandeis, lurk in insidious encroachment by men of zeal, well-meaning but without understanding, end quote. Fred saw in every bird, every squirrel, every horsefly, every rat, every skunk, every porcupine, a security risk and a present danger to his republic. <laughs> he had a dossier, dossier on almost every living creature, as well as on several inanimate objects, including my son's football. <laughs> I 
The loyal uh, further on. The loyalty theme also relates to Fred, who presses ever more heavily against me this morning. Fred was intensely loyal to himself, <laughs> as every strong individualist must be. He held unshakable convi convictions like Harry Truman. He was absolutely sure that he was in possession of the truth. Because he was loyal to himself, I found his eccentricities supportable. <coughs> Actually, he contributed greatly to the general health and security of the household. Nothing has been quite the same since he departed. His views were largely of a dissenting nature, yet in tearing us apart, he somehow held us together. In obstructing, he strengthened us. In criticizing, he informed. In his rich, aromatic heresy, he nourished our faith. He was also a plain damn nuisance. I must not forget that. <laughs> the matter of faith, new paragraph, the matter of faith has been in the papers again lately. President Eisenhower, I will now move over and welcome a Republican into bed, along with my other visitors, has come out for prayer and has emphasized that most Americans are motivated, as they surely are, by religious faith. The Herald Tribune had headed the story, quote, President says prayer is part of democracy, end quote. The implication in such a pronouncement emanating from the seat of government is that religious faith is a condition or even a precondition of the democratic life. This is just wrong. <laughs> a president should pray whenever and wherever he feels like it. Fred says, most presidents have prayed hard and long, and some of them in desperation and in agony, and Fred But I don't think a president should advertise prayer. That is a different thing. Democracy, if I understand it at all, is a society in which the unbeliever feels undisturbed and at home. It's a beautiful statement. And this is in the context of his talking about his dog watching birds in his bed. <laughs> It is stunning. And uh, one of the things, uh, those of us who are, are concerned about the environment and climate change, which is all bad news, is how do we, as a teacher, how do I get my students to learn what's happening um, and stay open to, to learning because they don't want to hear the bad news. Nobody likes to hear the bad news. Even my most progressive friends, when I come up with a new book that's just out, like Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, a must read, my most progressive friends, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to read it. I can't read it anymore. So what do you do with bad news? What do you do with heavy news? What do you do? How do you write about World War, the beginning of World War II in September 1939? Uh, it's astounding how he does it and makes it palatable so that we can read along with it, right? Um, and it is, it's such a, we can learn so much uh, from how he, how he balances uh, the serious um, and, the, and the lighter. Okay. Um, TV, July 1938. From One Man's Meat, from, from right from the beginning of One Man's Meat. And again, notice how completely relevant it is to our situation today. The news of television, so 1938, just beginning, right? I don't know when you all got your televisions, but we didn't have one until the 50s. So this, see, this is really early. The news of television is what I particularly go for when I get a chance at the paper. For I believe television is going to be the test of the modern world, and that in this new opportunity to see beyond the range of our vision, we shall discover either a new and unbearable disturbance of the general peace or a saving radiance in the sky. We shall stand or fall by television. Of that, I am quite sure. Now, think television. Think what television means today, all the things that have evolved from television. It's all started with television, right? It must have been two years ago that I attended a television demonstration at which it was shown beyond reasonable doubt that a person sitting in one room could observe the nonsense taking place in another. I recall being more amused by what was happening in the tangible room where I sat than by what appeared in the peephole of science. 
The images were plain enough, however, and my, by paying attention, I could see the whites of a pretty woman's eyes. Since then, I have followed the television news closely. Clearly, the race today is between loud speaking and soft, between things that are and things that seem to be, between the chemist of RCA and the angel of God. Radio has already given sound a wide currency, and sound effects are taking the place once enjoyed by sound itself. Television will enormously enlarge the eye's range, and like radio, will advertise the capital elsewhere. Will advertise the elsewhere. Together with the tabs, the mags, and the movies, it will insist that we forget the primary and near the, excuse me, we'll, it will insist that we forget the primary and the near in favor of the secondary and the remote. And I don't know if you hang out with 19-year-olds, but I do. And they are all in the remote. They're, I mean, literally, they are, they are not present. More hours in every 24 will be spent digesting ideas, sounds, images, distant and concocted. In sufficient accumulation, radio sounds and television sites may become more familiar to us than their originals. A door closing, heard over the air. Notice the detail. He zooms right in and gives you an example. A door closing, heard over the air, a face contorted, even in a panel, seen in a panel of light. These will emerge as the real and the true. And when we bang the door of our own cell, or look into another's face, the impression will be of mere artifice. I like to dwell on this quaint time when the solid world becomes make-believe, McCarthy, corporeal, and Bergen stuffed. You remember? When all is reversed and we shall be like the insane to whom the antics of the sane seem the crazy twistings of a, gr of a grid. When I was a child, people simply looked about them and were moderately happy. <laughs> when I was a child, people simply looked about them and were moderately happy. Today, they peer beyond the seven seas, bury themselves waist deep in tidings. And by and large, what they see and hear makes them unutterably sad. 1938. <coughs> June 1956. In an essay entitled Coon Tree. And the essay is about a coon. Who, who goes down the tree head first and then turns around the last minute, switches around, goes on at some length about this coon. And then he does this. <coughs> There's a little build up to this, but I'm gonna, so I'm gonna jump in here. I am not convinced that atomic energy, which is currently said to be man's best hope for a better life, is his best hope at all, or even a good bet. I am not sure energy is his basic problem, although the weight of opinion is against me. I would feel more optimistic about a bright future for man if he spent less time proving that he can outwit nature and more time tasting her sweetness and respecting her seniority. Almost every bulletin I receive from my country agent is full of wild schemes for boxing nature's ears and throwing dust in her eyes. And the last issue of the Rural New Yorker contained a tiny item saying that poultrymen had, quote, volunteered to quit feeding diphenyl paraphenylene diamine to chickens because it can cause illness in persons. One of the tardiest pieces of volunteer activity I ever heard of. <laughs> Yesterday it was reported in the, in the news that atomic radiation is cumulative 
and that no matter how small the dose, it harms the person receiving it and all his descendants. <coughs> Thus, a lifetime of dental x-rays and other familiar bombardments and fallouts may finally spell not better teeth and better medicine, but no teeth and no medicine, and a chicken dinner may become just another word for bellyache. The raccoon, for all her limit, now he's back to the coon. The raccoon, for all her limitations, seems to me better adjusted to life on Earth than men are. She has never taken a tranquilizing pill, has never been x-rayed to see whether she is going to have twins, has never added DPPD to the broiler mash, and is not out at night looking for thorium in rocks. She is out looking for frogs in the pond. <laughs> All right, so we have to talk, uh, I have to quote Charlotte's Web, of course. Is there anyone in this room who has not read Charlotte's Web? <laughs> it's the most uh, read children's book in the world. I think you all know it's been translated in just about every language. And uh, it's an uh, incredible piece of animal rights literature, as far as I'm concerned. And its opening line is the most famous line next to Call Me Ishmael. Does anyone remember this opening line? Where's Papa going with that axe? Does that bring it back to you? That is astounding. That is not the normal opening for a children's book. Where's Papa going with that axe? said Fern to her mother as they were setting the table for breakfast. Out to the hog house, replied Mrs. Arable. Some pigs were born last night. I don't see why he needs an axe, continued Fern, who was only eight. Well, said her mother, one of the pigs is a runt. It's very small and weak, and it will never amount to anything, so your father has decided to do away with it. <laughs> do away with it, shrieked Fern. You mean kill it just because it's smaller than the others? Mrs. Arable put her picture on the table. Don't yell, Fern. She said, your father's right. The pig would probably die anyway. Fern pushed a chair out of the way and ran outdoors. The grass was wet and the earth smelled of springtime. Fern's sneakers were sopping by the time she caught up with her father. You remember this fabulous illustration? Oh, trying to wrest the ax from her father. Please don't kill it, she sobbed. It's unfair. Mr. Arable stopped walking. Fern, he said gently, you will have to learn to control yourself. Control myself, yelled Fern. This is a matter of life and death, and you talk about controlling myself? Tears ran down her cheeks, and she took hold of the axe and tried to pull it out of her father's hand. Fern, said Mr. Arrow, I know more about raising a litter of pigs than you do. A weakling takes, makes trouble. Now run along. But it's unfair. <coughs> the pig couldn't help being born small, could it? If I had been very small at birth, would you have killed me? Mr. Arable smiled. So this is typical white. It's funny, and it's so poignant, and it's such an adult text. He has a wonderful, uh, wonderful interviews where he talks about children's literature has to speak, to speak, n not speak down to children. Uh, Mr. Arable smiled. Certainly not. So would you have killed me? Certainly not, he said, looking down at his daughter with love. But this is different. A little girl is one thing. A little runty pig is another. I see no difference, replied Fern, still hanging onto the axe. This is the most terrible case of injustice I have ever heard. A queer look came over John Arable's face. He seemed almost ready to cry himself. Wouldn't it be nice if we just could stay here and just read this book? <laughs> why not? Yeah, why not? Right. Um, so this book, uh, Charlotte's Web, is about death, as you all will remember. And it's a very frank and open uh, portrayal of, of the cycle of death. And uh, I'm reminded of the other children's book, Tuck Everlasting which looks at immortality and how that doesn't really work, even though we all somehow long for it. When we really get it, it doesn't work. So um, uh, it was a sounding book. It was very controversial, of course. Um, so I want to read you a quote from uh, Michael Sims. And his book is over there. He wrote a book called The Story of Charlotte's Web. And it's a book. How am I doing sound-wise? OK? Too loud? OK. Um, 
I'm usually too loud. My poor mother. Lower your voice, Nancy. Lower your voice. Yeah, calm down. <laughs> So uh, Michael Sims wrote this beautiful book, The Story of Charlotte's Web, and it's a biography of White, but focusing on his love of animals. It's a beautiful, delightful book. I recommend it. Uh, he wrote, in everyday life, White saw animals with the view of a farmer and an amateur naturalist. He knew how to increase egg production among his chickens, how to dock a lamb's tail, how to give a pig an enema. <laughs> yeah, hilarious descriptions of that. <laughs> yet, apparent, yet apparently, without a flicker of what a psychologist would call cognitive dissonance, he also saw animals as personality-rich companions on his own fanciful journey. He interpreted a Boston Terrier's bark as, quote, I'm in love and I'm going crazy. <laughs> when his hen house's, bro house's brooder stove burned itself out, he said he found the chicks, quote, standing around with their collars turned up, blowing on their hands and looking like a snow removal gang under the L on a bitter winter's night. <laughs> of his legendarily stubborn dachshund, Fred write, White wrote, quote, and when I answer his peremptory scratch at the door and hold the door open for him to walk through, he stops in the middle and lights a cigarette just to hold me up. <laughs> So, um, in exploring these essays and reading these essays, uh, <coughs> I, I had a personal delight. You know how exciting it is when you, you have friends that you, you, you love your friends so much, and you wish that this friend would meet this friend? You love them both so much, and then they meet and they love each other? Isn't that the most wonderful thing? So, here I am reading E.D. White, and I have two other favorite, uh, three other favorite authors, and it turns out that he, he loves them too. And in fact, had one to dinner. Um, so I'm talking, of course, first of Thoreau. Um, uh, E.B. White said that he only had one, he only owned one book. Well, that's true or not, it's <laughs> unlikely, but uh, he said, I only own one book and it's Walden. Um, and the, and the, and so I, I wanna, uh, read you a little bit, and he has beautiful essays about Walden. He has one essay in which it's a, it's a letter to Henry, dear Henry, and he's in the present, in the, at the time he's writing, telling Henry what uh, Concord is like and what Walden is like now, and it's, it's hilarious and serious at the same time. Um, Henry Thoreau was, this is from the Individualist essay from the New Yorker. Henry Thoreau was probably, has probably been more wildly misconstrued than any other person of comparable literary stature. He got a reputation for being a naturalist, and he was not much of a naturalist. He got a reputation for being a hermit, and he was no hermit. He was a writer is what he was, which is absolutely true. Walden, another uh, from, um, Another New Yorker essay. Walden is the only book I own, although there are some others unclaimed on my shelf. <laughs> Every man, I think, reads one book in his life, and this is mine. Who, would you say that about yourself? Could, can you think of one book that, you, if you said, I've, I've read one book in my life? Would you, would you, can everybody think of that, uh, one book? Yeah, Walden is certainly the book that changed my life. Every day, it didn't change it enough though. Still trying to get it changed where it needs to be. Um, sometimes you have to just read a book over and over before you get it. Every man I think reads one book in his life and this is mine. It is not the best book I ever encountered, perhaps, but it is for me the handiest. And I keep it about me in much the same way one carries a handkerchief for relief in moments of defluxion or despair. John Updike famously said of Walden that uh, next only to the Bible, it was in more houses in the United States and less read. <laughs> if our colleges and universities were alert, God help them, they would present a cheap pocket edition of the book Thoreau's Walden to every senior upon graduating, along with his sheepskin, or instead of it. 
Even if some senior were to take it literally and start felling trees, there could be worse mishaps. The act is older than the dictaphone, and it is just as well for a young man to see what kind of chips he leaves before listening to the sound of his own voice. The second uh, dear friend uh, that I uh, discovered in, was Rachel Carson. And um, Rachel Carson, remember you're going to put that in the evaluation. I'm giving a talk in Middlebury. Um, uh, approached Reader's Digest in 1945, proposing that she write an article on the destructive effects of spraying the pesticide DDT. And the magazine wasn't interested. So she approached the New Yorker. In 1951, the New Yorker, under the, under, uh, the Whites' uh, leadership, uh, serialized excerpts of her manuscript, quote, A Profile of the Sea, which was later published in book form under the title The Sea Around Us. Many of you have probably read it. Carson was, um, in uh, January 1958, the famous letter from her friend Olga Hutkins about the birds dying in her backyard from DDT. Um, uh, Carson approached the New York, uh, approached E.B. White and s asked him to write an article for the New Yorker about DDT. And he, in his wisdom, he knew her by then. She was a well-known writer, and as you all know, maybe, or don't know, she was a fabulous writer. She was not only a scientist, but she had the ability to write very clearly, and that's why she was able to be so effective. Um, E.B. White, in his wisdom, said, uh, you should write this book. And so she did, worked on it, uh, and uh, serialized it. It was serialized in The New Yorker um, and became uh, the book Silent Spring, which uh, was, is the pivotal book in the environmental movement. It began the whole thing. Um, Carson is responsible for the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Occupational Safety and Health Act, Environmental Protection Agency, etc and died uh, almost a martyr, really, to, to uh, cancer in 1964, testifying, by the way, in front of the Congress on DDT when she was in mortal pain from the cancer, um, but didn't tell anyone she had it because chemi <coughs> chemical companies were already trying to, to uh, 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 you know, discredit. discredit, thank you, I can't remember, I think it was disqualified, discredit her, and uh, God knows what. I actually went, when I gave this talk in uh, St. John's Bear, a guy came, in Newport, a guy came up to me afterwards and he said, I was in one of those chemical companies and we were doing a lot more than just trying to discredit her. It was really awful. But in any case, she kept her cancer to herself because she was sure that it would, it would, she would lose credibility. They would, oh, she's just upset because she has cancer. Um, in any case, they serialized uh, Silent Spring in June of 1962. Uh, it was, the book was published a year later, and, and Carson tragically died a year after that. Uh, she, one of my heroes, and it was wonderful to... And there are letters that I've read back and forth between uh, Catherine White and Rachel Carson and E.B. White, and uh, the letters are all preserved and wonderful. And then the third uh, beloved author that I was delighted to discover not only uh, had a very rich correspondence with Catherine and E.B. White, but also visited the farm several times with her, ooh, ooh, what did I just do? With, I forgot about this, <laughs> I forgot I'm wired, sorry. With uh, her lover, am I still on? Okay. Um, was uh, Elizabeth Bishop, uh, one of the great American poets of all times. And the letters are wonderful. Let me just read you one excerpt. This is just this. This whole book is just letters between Elizabeth Bishop and the New Yorker. M much of it, Catherine White. <clears throat> so this is uh, Catherine writing about the visit from. Uh, so uh, let's see. Elizabeth Bishop was very close friends with Robert Lowell. And her uh, partner of many years, Loda uh, de Marcedo, sorry, sorry, my pronunciation is terrible, uh, was also there with her. They were on their way maybe to Nova Scotia, but though they didn't get there. So it was 1957, 
During her 1957 trip, Bishop and her partner Loda went to White's Farmhouse for dinner with Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Hardwick uh, when visiting the Lowells in Castine. And White related this. Both Elizabeths looked beautiful, and we had a fine and very sober evening. That's a loaded uh, phrase because Elizabeth uh, suffered terribly from alcoholism. Elizabeth Bishop seems to be healthier and more good looking than I've ever seen her. She's svelte and chic, chic and free of asthma. Whether she's happy, I can't say. I thought she was beginning to worry because she had not written anything while on this trip, but it's natural enough that she hadn't been able to. She had given up on going to Nova Scotia as they had originally planned, and I was sorry for that because I was so anxious to have her write some more Nova Scotia short stories. And by the way, if you, if you know Elizabeth Bishop's poem but do not know her short stories, you must read them. They're, if, she, if she hadn't been such a wonderful poet, she would be well known for a short story. Um, so that's their writer uh, piece. And um, I want to just read you a, f a couple more things uh, uh, from an interview with uh, the Paris Review, famous interviews with authors. They, um, E.B. White uh, didn't want to be interviewed for a long time, but they finally got him to, to agree to it. He, he says in this interview that um, he talks about the writing of Charlotte's Web. And it was astounding to me. Let me read you this. Do, uh, the interviewer is George uh, Plimpton. Does the finished product need a gestation period? That is, do you put a finished work away and look at it a month hence? Uh, White. It depends on what kind of product it is. Many a poem could well use more than nine months. Um, on the other hand, a newspaper report of a fire in a warehouse can't be expected to enjoy a gestation period. When I finished Charlotte's Web, I put it away, feeling that something was wrong. And he had worked on it for like three years. And he puts it away. The story had taken me t two years to write, working on and off, but I was in no particular hurry. I took another year to rewrite it, and it was a year well spent. <clears throat> If I write something and feel doubtful about it, I, soak, I sock it away. The passage of time can be helpful, but in general, I tend to write. So what uh, Sims points out is that not only did he put it away, but he spent a year full-time researching spiders. <laughs> he spent months deciding which kind of spider Charlotte would be. And the details in that book, the natural details, just as in uh, The Trumpet of the Swan, are astounding. And what a, what, on, what a way to honor children, to give them that <laughs> kind of detail in a way that is so interesting, you can't put the book down. He spent a year studying spiders to get it right. Again, why? Anyone who writes down to children is simply wasting his time. You have to write up, not down. <laughs> children are demanding. They are the most attentive, curious, eager, observant, sensitive, quick, and generally congenial readers on earth. They accept almost without question anything you present them with as long as it is presented honestly, fearlessly, and clearly. I handed them, against the advice of experts, a mouse boy. I hope you all read Stuart Little as well as Charles. I handed them against the advice of experts, and people were outraged about this, by the way. Howard Ross stopped in his office and said, I can't believe you, you have made a terrible mistake having him be born. He should have been adopted. How can you have a mouse be born from a human? <laughs> that was really scandalous at the time. It was very upsetting. Um, well, I mean, when you think about it, it's a little bit upsetting, but anyway. <laughs> I handed them a mouse boy, and they, children, accepted it without a quiver. In Charlotte's Web, I gave them a literate spider, and they took that. Some writers for children deliberately avoid using words they think a child doesn't know. This emasculates the prose, and I suspect bores the reader. Children are game for anything. I throw them hard words, and they backhand them over the net. They love words that give them a hard time, provided they are in context that absorbs their attention. I'm lucky again, my own vocabulary is small compared to most writers, and I tend to use the short words, so it's no problem for me to write for children. Very self, always self-effacing.
Uh, in a country such as ours, which has become incre the interviewer, which has become increasingly enamored of and dependent upon science, what role do you see for the writer? And he answers that at some length, but then I want to. I think some writers have lost their sense of proportion, their sense of humor, and their sense of appreciation. I'm often angry, but I would hate to be nothing but angry. And I think I would lose what little value I may have as a writer if I were to refuse, as a matter of principle, to accept the warming rays of the sun and to report them whenever, whenever, and if ever, they happen to strike me. <coughs> One role of the writer today is to sound the alarm. The environment is disintegrating. The hour is late, and not much is being done. This is 1969, this is written. And not much is being done. Instead of carting rocks from the moon, we should be carting the feces out of Lake Erie. And I grew up on, on, in Cleveland and Lake Erie, and Lake Erie, uh, the Cuyahoga River uh, dumps into Lake Erie, and it famously caught fire um, in the late 50s. Lake Erie was completely dead. Miraculously, it's been brought back to life. Um, so there is some good news. Like here is back to life. Okay, um, I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to uh, cut to the chase and just remind you of the uh, say one word. Anyway, there's wonderful uh, more uh, quotes on the environmental and his environmentalism. It's it's, uh, it's like he was reading into the future. But let's close with Stuart Little. And I, I want to tell you that I was having dinner with a friend of mine soon after Allie White asked me to, to develop a talk on <coughs> or an evening of readings with Evie White. <coughs> and he's a, a retired University of uh, Michigan law professor, very distinguished man. And <coughs> I said I was giving a talk on Evie White, and he said, oh my god, he said, Stuart Little is my favorite book. <laughs> and he said, I read it to my law students and the last day of the last term I have them. I read them the last chapter of Stuart Little. And I, because of time, I will not read you the last. I will send you home to read the last chapter. But I'll just remind you that he's traveling to find his love, the bird, um, and uh, what's her name? Margalo, thank you. And he stops, he talks to a repairman, and they talk about whether, which way he was going. Which direction are you headed, the repairman asked. North, said Stuart. This is also nice for us Vermonters, right? <laughs> north, said Stuart. North is nice, said the repairman. I've always enjoyed going north. Of course, southwest is a fine direction, too. <laughs> yes, I suppose it is, said Stuart thoughtfully. Oh, and there's East, continued the repairman. I once had an interesting experience on the easterly course. You want me to tell you about it? No thanks, said Stuart. <laughs> the repairman seemed disappointed, but he kept right on talking. There's something about North, he said. Something that sets it apart from all other directions. <coughs> A person who is heading North is not making any mistake, in my opinion. <coughs> That's the way I look at it, said Stuart. I rather expect that from now on I shall be traveling north until the end of my days. Mm -hmm. Worse things that could happen worse things than that could happen to a person, said the repairman. Yes, I know, answered Stuart. Following a broken telephone line north, I have come from wonderful places uh, some come upon some wonderful places, continued the repairman. Swamps. Now notice the language here, this incredible poetic description. In the in the voice of the repairman. Swamps where cedars grow and turtles wait on logs, but not for anything in particular. <laughs> Fields bordered by crooked fences broken by years of standing still. Orchards so old they have forgotten where the farmhouse is. <laughs> this is why we, some of us have traveled north, yeah? In the north I have eaten my lunch in pastures rank with ferns and junipers, all under fair skies with the wind blowing. My business has taken me into spruce woods on winter nights where the snow lay deep and soft, a perfect place for a carnival of rabbits. <laughs> I have sat at peace on the freight platforms of railroad junctions in the north, in the warm hours and with warm smells. 
I know fresh lakes in the north, undisturbed except by fish and hawk, and of course by the telephone company, <laughs> which has to follow its nose. I know all these places well. They are a long way from here. Don't forget that. And a person who is looking for something doesn't travel very fast. That's perfectly true, said Stuart. Well, I guess I'd better be going. Thank you for your friendly remarks. Not at all. I hope you find that bird. Stuart rose from the ditch, climbed into his car, and started up the road that led toward the north. The sun was just coming over the hills on his right. As he peered ahead into the great land that stretched before him, the way seemed long. But the sky was bright, and he somehow felt he was headed in the right direction. Thank you very much. You have an example. You have an example handy from your collection of um, of uh, showing White's knowledge and detail about spiders that you alluded to. to uh, I don't have an example that I could pull, but it open open Charlotte's Web anywhere. Okay. And you and you'll see it. And also again, Trumpet of the Swan. The details in that about the swans are just stunning. Um, and, and Sims also details it in, in his book that's over there. Yes? Um, how did he come to write for the New York, uh, for the Harbors? Oh, okay. So he, let's see. So he moved, um, he moved to Maine. And so there was some, he was going to still write for the New Yorker, but he was pretty, be making a break with the New Yorker. He wasn't going to be in the offices anymore. And Harper uh, seduced him into doing it because um, Harper offered him a monthly longer essay, because in New Yorker he was writing these short pieces, what's now the talk of the town, right? And his name wasn't in it. And so Harper's uh, offered him a longer piece once a month and um, uh, with his name on it. Uh, and, but he didn't like it. He couldn't stand it. There's one letter I read this morning that he was that he said, I just can't, I can't write with deadlines. I have to write when I move to write. Which is, you know, he also had to write to, I mean, they had to make a living. They weren't independent, they both had to work to maintain it. So, uh, so we only stayed there four years and was, was not happy at the end. I don't have a question, I have a comment. The part of um, Charlotte's Web that I always think of is where um, this one fellow says, uh, what a remarkable spider. And the other, his friend looks at him and says, it's an ordinary spider. It's the pig that's remarkable. Look, it says so right in the web. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great one. <laughs> yes? I just want to say that uh, Oh, here's a mic coming. Oh, we have two mics. This is, what a library this is. You are a great, wonderful group, by the way. I love coming here. Yeah. The thing that I have always remembered because it made me giggle so much was a letter of his in which he uh, confided, I can't remember to whom, that he married Catherine Sergeant Angel because she called dental floss tooth twine. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very classic. I, I think if you put that out there, we would guess that E.B. White must have written it. Yeah, perfect. Yes, that he married Catherine White because she called dental floss tooth, tooth twine. twine. <laughs> tooth twine. <laughs> yes. Have you ever heard um, E.B. White reading Charlotte's Web? Uh, yes, I have. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. used to have the records. Yeah. Uh, there's also a recording of his son, Joel, who has since passed away, um, of um, uh, reading E.B. White. And it was, he, he, it's a CD of his reading of the things that he read to E.B. White as he was uh, suffering from Alzheimer's and on his way out. But, but still alert enough to appreciate it. At one point, a couple of points, he would say, who wrote that? <laughs> And then he would be really pleased when Joel would say, you did that. That's good, he said. <laughs> you 
You said that um, Charlotte's Web was controversial when it was released. Why? Well, because it was about death. That's a big thing. There was also, there's also controversy about anthropomorphizing animals, and that's a whole other talk. You could write that in your evaluation. I'll come back and give you that talk. But you know, that issue of having animals talk, et cetera. But mainly it was controversial because I think it was banned in places too because it was so brutal. It was so, so in your face around in the opening that I read. And it's so sad. I mean, I, uh, yeah, right. Oh, Yeller. Uh, Are you aware, really aware of any poetry that he read? Yes, poets I, that he particularly liked? Oh, no. I don't know what poets he read. Um, I thought you were going to ask about his poetry, which is uh, not really quotable. That's my judgment. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think I have in the description that I'm going to use his poem, but he was really an essayist more than a poem. He did pub publish some, some poems, but. Nothing that, that resonates with me enough for me to share. Uh, but I don't know his favorite poets. I know he loved uh, Elizabeth Bishop's work and the work. I mean, he, they were, uh, uh, Andy and Catherine uh, were so close. They were always reading each other. She was his editor. They were enmeshed and, and, and apparently in wonderful ways by all reports. I, I, I was sneaking around Brooklyn last summer and trying to meet some people. And I did meet this woman that worked for them. Um, so there's, and, and the library, by the way, if you get to Brooklyn, Maine, they have a beautiful little library funded in large part by the whites and supported by the whites. Catherine was very, very involved in getting that library off the ground. And when I went in and said I was researching, I was here for a week, I was doing some research on white, they just rolled the red carpet out for me. I got this big file out, and on the, <clears throat> on the wall is a, one of the original drawings of Stuart Little from the illustrator in a big frame. It's really worth going to Brooklyn to, to see it and to, and to quietly walk past the farmhouse on the road, <laughs> pretending you're not looking. I'm not a tourist. I'm not really looking. <laughs> But he would have read. He would have read all the poets that were published in the New Yorker, and would be very familiar with them. So name just about any famous American poet. They were in the New Yorker during those, during those years, the 30s and 40s, 50s, that they were doing that. So, yeah. Do you know if E. B. White? Oh, thanks. <clears throat> Do you know if E. B. White had a spiritual practice of any kind? Yes. Good something? question. Um, if you don't mind, I just wanted to mention. Did yes, E.B. White have a spiritual practice because there's a point in Charlotte's Web where Wilbur, the pig, lists the things he's going to do during the day, and one of them is spend 20 or so minutes not doing anything but thinking about um, how good it is to be alive. Yes. Well, that's, that about sums up my understanding of his spiritual practice. Um, he did not go, as I mentioned earlier, he did not go to church. Um, uh, we Unitarians like to think he's in our, uh, in our camp, uh, so to speak. We claim anyone that doesn't go to church. Um, but, you know, Emily, Emily Dickinson uh, famously said, my, the, the woods are my church, right? She, didn't also, she also didn't go to church, but she was very deeply religious, obviously, and her, and her spirituality was from the woods and from her garden and from outside. Um, um, and the same with E.B. White. His spirituality was in the barn with the animals. Mm -hmm. He was very, I mean, his attachment to animals is so deep, it's so obvious that I don't really talk about it directly. I just try to read you a few excerpts. But um, from a young age, he was very attached to animals. And he, his, his uh, painful shyness around people, um, he was just much more at home. And he would spend hours, was one hours in the barn, as I say, taking care of the little chicks that arrived in the mail. Um, and there's this one moment around the war, this horrible news from the war, and his being called in to hear something on the wireless and realizing and feeling guilty that he was spending so much time with the chickens when this war was going on and he should be doing more. But then realizing that this, this being with these chicks is the best thing he could be doing. And it, was, it has such spiritual quality to, to it. And all the essays, there is a spirituality throughout his essays that feels very deep to me, um, uh, but, but no organized religion. 
and nothing that I have found in terms of you know, Buddhist meditation or anything, but certainly, certainly doing nothing, 20 minutes doing nothing, which is, of course, what people now call meditation, is, um, that's sort of a joke, but I know better than that, but um, it's on the way to meditation, isn't it? With it, we could do nothing more often. I've got kind of a strange um, question. You mentioned that he was extremely introverted and shy, and do you think that perhaps, did you find any evidence that his attachment to animals versus not opening up to humans, do you think there was any chance he would be on the Asperger's syndrome scale? Mm, uh, no, I don't have, no, because okay. he was quite charming when he, well, I don't know enough about Asperger's to say, okay. Okay. so I I'm gonna this. stick my foot in my mouth, I think I already did. Um, <laughs> But he was—he he didn't have trouble with people he knew well, but it was just uh, people coming to, especially when he became famous, he couldn't stand that. Just curious. Yeah, yeah. I think he had severe anxiety and maybe a little OCD. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, um, not severe, but he, he writes about... Cons Never mind. Yeah. I was just curious. Yeah, he struggled a lot. He struggled. The depressions were sometimes quite long and difficult. Catherine walked him through it. Yes. I just had to tell this. Um, oh, good. My husband and I, we had two children, and um, and we always read stories aloud. I mean, you know, usually I was the one who read the story because I never ate dessert. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so I would be sitting there reading. But I remember we were up in our camp up in North, in Brookfield, Vermont, and it was a rainy day, and we were having lunch, and we were reading Trumpet of the Swan, or starting Trumpet of the Swan. And my son, who then had just gotten to be about 10 or 12, you know, and he looked at me across the table and he said, Mom, if that trumpet, swan gets a trumpet, that's too much for me. <laughs> That's great. It was the, the moment of great rebellion. I mean, I thought of all the folks. <laughs> if that swan gets a trumpet, <laughs> I, I'm out of it. That's a great story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's great. This image, you know, fr the Fred in the bed uh, image is so wonderful, but the other, it, the, he sp they spent a lot of time in bed. They had this big bed, and they had books and papers all over their bed, and his descriptions of these are hilarious. So he's got the dachshund, one or at least, or at least one dachshund, almost always on the bed, and then bed, then uh, Catherine's always editing papers, so there's papers all over the place, and books. She's we're always reviewing children's books. She, by the way, I have it over there, as I wrote a beautiful garden book, Any Gardeners in the Room, and one of my friends is, will vouch for this book, because she's a gardener. It's like the gardener's favorite book of all. She absolutely, the, the one book that Catherine did re write and that uh, Evie White edited after she died, and it actually kept him going, that he could be working and helping edit her work after all the, uh, the many, many decades that she edited his work. Well, thank you very much. Oh, Elements of Style, yes. Okay, so I had that over there to refresh your memory. You all had it in high school, probably. I still think it's the best book out there. It's um, his professor at Cornell. It's notes from, from the course he took with him. Strunk and White is the White. And then is, uh, but the White's uh, contribution is the essay at the end, the, uh, the Approaches of Style, I think it's called. And that, that still is, I mean, just the best. You want to improve your writing, read that. It'll take you 10 minutes and you'll, you'll be a better writer overnight. It's a fabulous essay. What personality did Catherine have? Sorry? What was Catherine's personality like? Well, very, well, you can imagine, as an editor, a chief editor of The New Yorker in 1925, a career woman, very strong personality. And, and thank you for asking this because I started to say it earlier and I didn't get to it. She was, she's not, she was not only editor, poetry editor and fiction editor for a while, but she was mother hen to all these writers. So she not only helped edit them, but she also would call them up if they weren't producing and, and help them through their writer's block. 
She would worry about how they ate and how their sleeping habits were. She worried terribly about poor Elizabeth Bishop, who was up and down and sober and not sober and uh, you know, really struggled. And being, of course, a lesbian in those days was horrifying, mm -hmm. horrible. And um, uh, uh, Catherine White was just mother to so many of these, uh, these writers. And th uh, the correspondence is just, it goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And these, these letters are very touching. Very strong, very loving, very nurturing woman. And obviously very nurturing to uh, her husband, E.B. White. Remember in that article, Roger Angel said that she mothered her authors and edited her children. Yes, wonderful <laughs> phrase. Okay, thank you, Ethel. Yes. So she, Roger Angel was her uh, son from the first marriage. And um, uh, that's a wonderful quote, yes. And one could only imagine that, uh, that that's exactly what what it was like. <laughs> I sometimes worry about that. You know, when you're a teacher, don't you worry that you're, you're being too nice to your students and editing your children, nurturing your students and editing your children? Well, thank you very much. This has been All right, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.